All right, well, good afternoon and good evening to everyone out there. Uh, Marcus Sitaro, the winemaker here at Stag Zeep Wine Cellars, and thank you so much for joining me. This is the first in a five-part series we're gonna be doing where we're honoring the legacy of this historic winery. We're honoring 50 years this year with our founding uh, being in 1970, of course. So I hope you're able to join for all five. Uh, hopefully in each one, we'll bring a bit of history, a bit of knowledge to the winery, and a bit of knowledge of what we're doing out in the vineyards uh, here as well. And listen, I hope everybody out there is staying safe. I hope you guys are all staying healthy. Uh, I hope that in all this craziness uh, that's going on right now, that you guys, I'm just honored that you'll be joining me to uh, taste some fun wines and uh, to hear some great stories about what's happening here at the winery. Uh, but first, let me bring you into the vineyard. And where I'm coming to you from right now is inside the Fay Outlook and Visitor Center. I know a lot of you folks have visited us uh, here before, and we're looking forward to the time when we're able to welcome you back. Right outside, of course, though, as you remember, is the beautiful Fay Vineyard. There's a lot happening in the vineyards right now. And the one thing that has happened is specific is we've had bloom and set. So what I grabbed out of the Fay Vineyard here, this is a cluster to show you. So what happens, the, the grapes, they pollinate, they flower, they, it smells beautiful, it's almost this sweet aroma. And then those individual berries then, they self-pollinate and set and they're starting to form these beautiful little Cabernet berries right now. So th at this stage, what we'd like to see is actually to see them out and exposed to the sun. Um, it's an important time in terms of flavor development. So not only then are we kind of monitoring what's happening out here with the crop, how the clusters look, how many of them there are, how the set wet, but we're also looking at the canopies and watching the grapes grow. And uh, there's many uh, high-tech methods of, of seeing how happy or sad your vineyard's doing from a irrigation standpoint. There's pressure bombs and fancy neutron probes and stuff like that. But for winemakers, you know, I need something that's pretty low tech where I can just kind of jump out. So the way I look at a vineyard, and I grab these from uh, right outside the door here, is I'm looking at the tops of how these grapes are growing. Right now, they're pretty happy, but as you can see on the very top of this vine, it's starting to slow down. And these tendrils, this is your indicator. When the tendrils are sticking straight up, that means the vine still has lots of water, it still is very happy, and it's still growing. When they start to slow down, like in this vine right out here, where you can see these nodes, the differences between the leaves are becoming shorter and shorter, then you know that this plant, it's starting to slow down. It's gonna to start to turn over and more uh, focus on the fruit. Luckily, our vineyard manager, Kirk Grace, did not see me take these and was able to escape without, well, hopefully he's not, and hopefully he's, uh, hopefully he's not watching. So again, uh, I just wanna welcome everyone. Uh, again, I'm Marcus Nataro, and uh, we're gonna go through a bit of, of history today. You know, our winery has got such a wonderful history and a part uh, of the Napa Valley. If you guys have questions uh, while we're going along, I know you can type it into one of the comments there in Instagram, and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can um, as we go. But our founding uh, really, let me put you in Napa Valley. So in 1970, it was really a, a time of experimentation. It was kind of a new beginning, you know, new uh, modern start. You know, the wine industry uh, in the 20s, you know, the great idea of prohibition had really put a kibosh on what was happening in Napa, and it really had taken that long for things to start to emerge um, and start to, to, to be reborn again. Um, in 1961, uh, a man named Nathan Fay planted the Fay Vineyard. He planted Cabernet Sauvignon in what today is known as the Stags Leap District. And at that time, there wasn't any Cabernet planted south of Rutherford and maybe only 700 acres of Cabernet Sauvignon that was planted so around the Napa Valley. So the Fay Vineyard was planted in 1961, and of course it has such a great, important part uh, of our history. Uh, our founder then, Warren Vernarski, uh, met and tasted uh, Mr. Fay's homemade wine in 1969, and as he said it, it was when the bottle was, the cork was pulled out, it was the aromatics alone, the beautiful uh, floral and cherry character of the, of the characters of the Fay Vineyard that that was his aha moment. This is the style, this is the character of Cabernet Sauvignon that I'm looking for in Napa Valley. And there's just so happened to have been 40 acres of land for sale directly adjacent, uh, directly south uh, of the Fay Vineyard that at that time was planted mostly to prunes. There were some other fruit trees, a few grapes as well. And that is the parcel uh, that Mr. Wernarski purchased, planted Cabernet Sauvignon, named the vineyard Stag's Leap uh, Vineyard. 
and the first vintage then would have been produced, a small amount of wine would have been produced then in 1972. But now we've got to fast forward a few years. Fast forward to 1976. Again, this was an emerging time, and really if you look in the world of wine uh, at this time, there was really only one place that was known when we we're talking about quality wines, and that would be, of course, over to France and the wines of Burgundy and the wines of Bordeaux. Napa Valley, like many other uh, wine regions in the world, although we're producing wine, we're not really on the stage in terms of being known for that superior quality. Uh, but a man named Stephen Spurrier, a British wine merchant uh, who had a wine shop in Paris, France, uh, knew there were some Americans and Brits that were visiting his shop. He had visited Napa Valley, tasted the wines, felt he could sell these wines to these folks that were visiting his shop. So he organized the tasting, uh, brought in 20 renowned uh, French judges, uh, and had a blind tasting of the finest wines of Burgundy, uh, along with some Napa Valley Chardonnays and the finest wines of Bordeaux. When the results were revealed uh, in the Burgundy category, it was the 1973 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay uh, that had won in the Burgundy category. And then when the results were revealed, it was the 1973 SLV, so Stag's Leap Vineyard, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, that had won in the Bordeaux category. So there was one writer uh, that was in the audience, uh, his name was George Tabor, and he wrote a little article called The Judgment of Paris that appeared on page like 56 of Time Magazine. I wanna show you the article, it's innocent as it is. And this little article right here is what, you know, documenting the results of this tasting that was kind of the uh, going viral, I guess, of the time in the, seven, in the 70s as this shocking victory uh, by these American wines. And uh, it was a, kind of the shot that went round the world, stunned the wine world, and is really that kind of defining moment for Napa Valley. You know, as Warren put it, it was a glass ceiling breaking type moment for viticulturalists and winemakers in the Napa Valley. It inspired confidence. It's like, yes, we can do it and basically uh, uh, kind of just, or you know, gave them the confidence that yes, we are a world, a world known or world famous or world class producing area for Chardonnay and uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon uh, as well. It's a very important part of our history. Um, I don't know if you can see behind me here, but we do have a few bottles of the 1973 uh, that are left. Uh, I've been very honored uh, to have tasted this wine uh, not all that long ago, and it's a special experience. It's obviously a special wine in terms of history, and it still has the fresh taste. It still has a wonderful character of SLV that I'm going to describe for you um, in a second. Um, a lot of you folks have visited this, and if you do come to the winery here, we have some other historical uh, documents for folks to view as well, with some of the uh, tasting notes and uh, the letter that, are, uh, that were sent uh, to the winery back then. So as soon as we're back open and you come visit, we're happy to, uh, you can see these things uh, in person. Okay, but, so what is it with, with her SLV? I mean, it is a, uh, I absolutely love, and my winemaking team, I mean, we're, we're honored to work with this particular vineyard, with both of our vineyards, but what is it about SLV that is so special, and what is the real characteristics of it? So uh, SLV is grown in, 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 for those of you that have visited, we have the rocky outcroppings that kind of surround the Stag's Leap District. Uh, remember when Mr. Fay first planted Cabernet here, it was thought to be too cold for Cabernet Sauvignon, but in fact, these kind of ring of rocks, this bowl, we get quite warm in the early afternoon, and that's what really brings out nice ripe flavors in Cabernet Sauvignon. But we are south, uh, so we do get these early sea breezes that start to cool us off late in the, after in the afternoon, and then fog here lingers uh, until uh, maybe about 9.30 or so in the morning. That's kind of the, the climactic setting where this vineyard is planted. But it's, in young, it's been planted in young volcanic soil that has been eroded off of those rocky outcroppings that are above the vineyard. You know, when we have, uh, during the wintertime, when we have these big rain events, like maybe we'll get 10 inches of rain over the weekend, it is a great time to jump in your truck and drive out in the vineyard, don't get stuck, um, and see like where your soils come from. And sure enough, when you drive up to the very top of SLV, um, you'll see the water that's rushing down off of the hillside that's above it, 
you see the rocky, the red rocks up above, and I'm not sure how well we'll be able to see it, but I grab this is Kirk's soil sample to show you this coarse red texture. When you walk up through this particular vineyard, you don't want to go up there with a new pair of shoes. The dust will come over and kind of put this, this coating over your, over your boots, over your shoes. But this combination then of our weather here, this soil, gives SLV a special character. Um, I think with any vineyard, you know, for a vineyard to really be great, it has to have a personality. And that personality is something that you see in the older wines and you see it in the young wines. You know, every vintage is going to be a little bit different with wine. You know, we have some vintages that are warmer, riper characters. Uh, there's some vintages that are cooler, get a cooler feel to them. We have wetter years, we have drier years. But when you open up a vertical, when you go back in time and taste through wines from a single vineyard, if you can pick out the character of that vineyard in each of those glass, it might be expressed a little bit in different ways, then that to me means the vineyard has personality, it has a character. And for SLV, to me, it's this beautiful dusty cocoa powder, it's violets, it's black currant, some black cherry, and the structure of SLV is rich, but not too heavy. It's a very filling wine. Um, it's also a very fun wine to ferment um, in that it's a wine that is it's a challenge, you know, because again, we want to make the, I want to capture the richness, capture the character without that wine becoming uh, too over the top. Also, the orientation of the vineyard, I think it's beautiful and how the vineyard is laid out uh, and to get great uniformity in terms of sun and in terms of exposure. It's a vineyard that in terms of longevity um, can age very gracefully. I mentioned that we had the 73 not too long ago. I'm about to open a bottle of 19, uh, 1978. And uh, it's a vineyard that produces wines that, are, that have great potential for ageability, which for me is something uh, that is very, a very important component uh, in the wines that we produce here, here today. And you actually, there are a few library wines that are available. Uh, I believe if you click, I'm not sure where it is on your screen, uh, the bottom of your screen, I'm being told, uh, but we do have some 2009, 2010, uh, 2013, which I'm gonna open here uh, in a second as well. And uh, those are fun, really fun wines to, uh, to taste today. Okay, and on to the tasting, and hopefully you've already been tasting, you didn't have to wait for me to taste, but I'm gonna grab a couple of uh, winemaking tools, all right? And uh, we're gonna open up a couple of wines. I thought it might be fun to, uh, in just in talking about older wines and wines that can age, it's, uh, it's always kind of a question is to, well, all right, well, how do, what's the best way to open them? And uh, in my experience, so this is what I do. So if I'm gonna open up an older bottle of wine, uh, the first step is, well, of course, is taking it out of the cellar. And so when you take it out of the cellar, you know, hopefully it's been stored on its side, you're going to want to pick it up and set it up upright for at least a day or two, or at least maybe even you'll see this some sommeliers will take the wines out of their rack and at least put it at a bit of an angle. You know, some wines will have a little bit of sediment, and that's all we're trying to do by lifting the bottle straight up and down is we're trying to get that sediment to settle down to the bottom, which will make it a little bit easier when we open the wine. So I've already taken the capsule off, but this is the tool that I love to use with older wine. This actually is a combination cool tool called a Durant, but I'm going to use what is called an Osso. So this might be scary to look at when you first think you're going to use this because you think you're going to sink the cork, but you just got to trust me and you just got to be patient. So you notice that there are two ends of this, right? One end is a little bit longer than the other. The longer end goes in first. So I'm going to run this down. Here we go. Right down the side. And as soon as I can get a little bit more of this past the lip, then I'm gonna flip that in. And then very gentle, so you see how that's on each side? Now I'm very gently gonna rock left, right, left, right. If you feel the cork's gonna sink on you, just gotta go slower, maybe back up a little bit. But once you get it all the way down to the bottom, so here I'm flush with the cork. I'm gonna grab the edge right here, give it a twist. And as soon as I can get my, two, my fingers in on, this, on the, the two tines of the osso, I'm going to grab that and I'm going to twist. 
nice and slow. Voila, out. Okay, next step. There's probably going to be, and now I'm going to, I, I already had worked on the uh, 87 here, or 78, excuse me. I'm going to grab this, this guy, get that out. It's a nice looking cork. So, might be a little bit of sediment that is formed right inside the lip of the bottle. You can use a cloth. Uh, you can use, which of course I left, uh, or you can use, use well, your finger. There's actually not really a whole lot of sediment that's in here. And then I grab a decanter. You know, with older wine, I like to, t some folks like to like open it up and I gotta open the bottle for like three hours before I pour it, before I taste it. I actually, with older wines, like to pop the cork and at least decant the wine and then taste it soon. And then you can allow the wine to open up uh, in your glass. But the key when you're decanting it then is you wanna catch the sediment, right? So we've got a little bit of sediment that's probably formed on the bottom. So I grabbed a very fancy flashlight that we use for checking barrels around here. And that's how, as I get to the bottom, I'm gonna grab this and see if I can find where that sediment is and that's where I'll stop pouring it. So here we go. Old school, you can use a candle to do this. All right, now comes the fun part. All right, so I'm gonna hold this right here. And I am going to try to find, I've gotta look at the light, otherwise I can't see where it comes. And bam, there we go. Now comes the fun part. So we poured 1978 SLV, and next to it, 2013 SLV, 78. I mean, this is a great vintage for Napa Valley. I'm pretty excited to try this. It's a year where the drought really broke. I mean, the vineyards at this point in time obviously were different. You know, there, and we still actually have a, about four acres of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon that was planted in 1972. It's called uh, our SLV Block 4. So it's really fun for me to walk up and not only see the history of these vines, but see how they were grown. They're growing much bigger than, they were, than, than we grow vines today. There's a lot of uh, more uh, road, um, there's a lot more spacing between the rows because the size of the tractors in the 70s was very different than the sizes of the tractors today. Um, this wine is, uh, it's 98% cab, has a little bit of uh, Merlot in it, spent about 16 months in barrel. And boy, you put your nose up to it, and again, those characters of this vineyard, and hopefully you have a glass of SLV that, you can, that you're tasting from, whatever vintage you have, and you should get, again, that dusty cocoa powder. I get a little bit of like a cedary spice in this wine, uh, but also, uh, the violets, this little, not beautiful floral characteristic as well. Mark, we got a good question. How much wine did we lose in the 78 by I actually did, did not lose very much. I mean, this is, uh, and I was pretty generous when I stopped. So, gosh, I mean, I figure that's like 20 mils maybe. So you can run that through a, uh, through a cloth if you really wanted to, um, to get every last bit out of that bottle, but, uh, but no, there actually was not, and, and every, everyone can be a little bit different, the wines can be a little bit different, also depends a bit on how they've been stored. Uh, but this wine uh, not only has aged beautifully, I mean, look at the color of this stuff. This is 1978, beautiful. It's gonna be fun. And then I've got 2013. So 2013, um, you know, this vintage, again, every vintage is a little bit different. You know, that's kind of the keys to what we do in terms of how we farm the grapes and also in terms of vinification as well. You know, every year can be a little bit different um, and we adjust to what we see. Uh, 13 was a very dry uh, winter. Um, we kind of, it was the start of a bit of a drought uh, that we had here in Napa Valley. Um, and so the grapes, when they grew, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have a big, huge canopy, maybe three, four feet of canopy and stop. And we had a lot of light exposure on the fruit um, and in those types of years, you tend to wind up with wines that have a little more tannin 
and a little more power. In terms of a growing season, 13 was a beautiful growing season. It'd be considered to be a little bit warm, but it was a year really without a lot of drama and produced wines that are really, it was a power year uh, for Napa Valley. Um, today, uh, these wines are, uh, I always, if folks ask, you know, when is the first time to open uh, a bottle of our wine? And I mean, again, the wines can last, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but if you, if you had more than one, let's say, let's say you had a case, right? I always say, look at the vintage date that's on the bottle and then add six or seven years. So at that point, so this wine is about seven years old. It still has some of the youthful character to it, but it's just, it's like getting out of its teenage years and it's becoming uh, more resolved as well. You know, for me, um, it's important for me to understand our, our history. Um, it's important for me to understand the characters of the wines. And, and the reason for that, for myself, for my assistant winemakers, I mean, it is my, our sincere desire to express this place. Um, SLV, and later we'll, we'll talk about the Fay Vineyard, these are special vineyards, they have a special character, and the way that we grow the grapes and the way we vinify the wines, I want to produce the finest expression um, of this vineyard that I possibly can. Mark, how do you store these wines? How do we store them? Well, you know, I think at home, let's say, the key is to have a stable temperature. So you want to get them out of the sunlight, right? So depending on your situation, where you're at, keep them out of light. You want to keep them, I do think it's important, especially if you're going to, talking about wines, you're going to age for long term, uh, to at least have the wines be on their side to keep those corks wet. But the key is just stable temperature. You know, if it's 50, if it's 55, if it's 60, if it's 63, um, obviously the cooler it is, the slower those wines will age. Uh, but the real key is to have a stable condition. And the reason for that is pretty simple. You know, these are corks. You saw there wasn't anything extra that held this cork uh, in, this in this bottle of wine. And if the temperatures fluctuate during the day, they get warm, then the wine inside is going to expand, right? Push a little bit of air out. And then if it was to cool off later in that day, then it's going to draw in a little bit of air so that it's like, it's like, it's like the wine it breathes, right? It's breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And uh, that is what causes the wines not to age quite as well as having them in a real stable temperature condition and definitely keep it out of the sunlight. So, you know, I've had, a, I've, I've stored wine in, a, in the, the uh, crawl space of our house <laughs> and where, it, again, it was, uh, it might have been cold in the winter, cooler than, than you would want in the winter, maybe a little bit warmer than we wanted in the summer, but it was stable at least day and night, and I was it had some success with aging wines in that condition. Someone's asking, do you know the street value of the 1978? Boy, I do, I, I do not. That would, be, uh, that would be a fun thing to look up. Um, uh, well, I think when it was bottled, it was maybe 1350 uh, a bottle. <laughs> Probably a little more than that, a little more than that today. 